Uh, hey, good evening. My name is David Batstone, and I am an entrepreneur. I am someone who owns a social investment fund and a professor. And so these skills, this career, I am now deploying to address a problem that's global. It's in your backyard, it's in mine, but it reaches to every country and every city in the world. It's called human trafficking. It's modern slavery. And I'm really excited about the fact that I can use the same skills that I use to build Silicon Valley companies, that I use to uh, build global investment, that I can use to the same innovation to try to address a global problem that I believe we can solve. So I want to take you through some of the steps that we're using on a global level, but particularly here in Africa, to address forced labor, involuntary servitude, forcing people to work without any free will, without any real pay, and taking them sometimes across the other side of the world. When I first discovered this, it was in my own backyard in San Francisco, believe it or not. Over 500 young kids had been brought from India into the United States to a restaurant that I used to frequent every couple of weeks. Couldn't believe it. They were brought to work washing dishes, waiting on tables. And so when I discovered this in my local neighborhood, I thought, well, where else could this be happening? So I went all over the United States and then all over the globe, trying to identify how the money flows, where the traffickers are, and I discovered that indeed it addressed those who are most vulnerable because of their immigration status, because of their poverty, because of their gender. Four out of five people who are thrown into slavery today are women, or because of their youth, because they're young and have, are defenseless. So I first went to Thailand, and then I went to India, and then I came to Africa, to Uganda, Mozambique, South Africa. And I wanted to create some tools that really address not only those who are victims, but how do we stop it from happening. Our first project was really to build a village for about 127 kids on the border between Burma and Thailand. It's a great project. Uh, project. It's like being at the end of a stream where you're pulling out those who are drowning. But at some point, you also need to walk upstream to say, how do we stop the victims from falling in the river? So we began to create some tools using technology and the best of innovative finance. One tool that we're now building and have available is called Slavery Map, slaverymap.org. You can go anywhere in the world and go onto this tool. It's an it's a interactive map. And it's a wiki where you're able to then click down on any point on the map and see, well, where was that case? What kind of trafficking was it? This one is in Cape Town. It was a case where a young girl from Moldova was brought to Cape Town, and she was forced to work in a strip club. Her passport was taken from her, and she would have to pay 60,000 rand to get her passport back. She said, I don't have that kind of money. I said, well, you're going to have to do some services for us. If you don't, we're going to have to use violence against you because you owe us money. It's the most common form of entrapment in the world. Well, we say where it happened, where she came from. Did law enforcement get involved in helping her get free? Once she got free, did she get services? Was there a shelter for her? Was there legal services? Was she treated like a criminal and deported, or did she get safe haven here? That's really important to know when you're looking at a region, whether it's a city or a country, because as you start to multiply this kind of case load, you get to see... Where are the victims coming from? Just three weeks ago or four weeks ago, our team discovered a young teenage girl on a street corner here in Cape Town. She was from Nigeria, and she shared with our team, our not-for-sale team, that she had been brought here three days before the World Cup and was being forced to sell her body by her traffickers. She was with other teenage girls from Nigeria the same age. Our team then took the evidence who she was, where she was being held, and took it to local law enforcement with whom we'd built a good relationship, a trusting relationship here. We then worked with them to intervene, free those girls, and we put eight traffickers from a Nigerian crime syndicate in jail. So this is the power of being able to identify where there's trafficking. We also heard of a case on the border between Uganda and Kenya, a cattle market where each Friday afternoon, ranchers come and they sell cattle back and forth. They reserve one stall for young kids. 
They sell them particularly to be beggars, like Slumdog Millionaire. To be beggars in the streets so that the traffickers then take the money off the kids. We went to the Ugandan National Police and said, hey, we want to help you be able to gather evidence. How can we be most of support? And we began to share with them some of the tools. We use iPhones to create GPS coordinates on where we find a trafficked child. We're able to share video streaming evidence. And we are now working with them to shut down this cattle ranch or this cattle market. Those are the kinds of activities we're doing around legal justice. Now, I also wanted to do more, not only around legal justice, but also around creating models that are innovative in the ways that they help people who are vulnerable. You can imagine that those who are trafficked most often in the world today are those who live under $2 a day. They're vulnerable economically. Typically, they're women and their children. They're very vulnerable. So what would it mean to use the best of the finance skills that many of us in the room have? I've started companies by investment and by being an executive. What would it mean to use that same knowledge base, that same passion, that same drive to be successful? What would it mean to use that that would solve global problems? You see, we need the best of us to start fixing this world. It's a mess. We need the best of us, not those who by default can't do anything else. Right? Go join a nonprofit if you can't start a company. Are you kidding me? If you're not smart enough or innovative enough to work for the uh, Not For Sale campaign, go work for Dell Computer or something, all right? We're looking for innovative people. Well, you've heard the aphorism that where there are people hungry, if you give them a fish, they'll eat for a day. If you teach them how to fish, they'll eat for a lifetime. It's not true. Well, maybe half true. You see, you give someone a fish... It's better than being hungry. They'll survive. You teach them how to fish. That could be sustenance if they ever get access to the pond. If you don't have access to the pond or you don't have equity in the pond, your future is always vulnerable to those who own it. So how do we go about creating the kind of equity in individuals' futures who are at risk? One model I want to share with you is one we're doing in Cambodia. We bought a garment factory because that was a skill set that would be easy to teach in a country where there's low education. Then we went to shelters where women, particularly, had been pulled out of rug looms or out of brothels, and we provided investment and training for them to be an entry-level position in our garment factory. And as they came to the garment factory, they're given the choice not always to be a seamstress, but to identify skills like, you're very good at design. Maybe you should go into some of our fashion work. Or you're really good at numbers. Maybe you should go into accounting. And they're given the opportunity to develop their skill sets so that maybe one day they'll go into another mainstream job. Every six months that they work at the garment factory, they are given shares of stock in the company, so they become an equity owner of the company. If they leave, that's convertible into cash so that they now have a certain stakeholder in their future. Those are the kind of models that you and I, we develop every day in trying to create good businesses. Why not deploy those in a way that generate wealth for those who are outside the gates of the city. You know, I even believe as a business professor, there is a huge market potential to developing enterprises that benefit the bottom billion. There's a billion people who live in less than $2 a day. That's a big market, even if you can increase that to $4 a day. I have companies now in China, Cambodia, and Peru. They're all profitable. And they're employing people who formerly were outside the economic potential of the city. So, using innovative models to create new enterprise also is a way of giving future to those who don't have that opportunity. Finally, I discovered as I went around the globe investigating how the slave trade works today, well, Forbes magazine helped me out. Forbes had a cover story last year that said, child slavery, why are we all addicted to it? Unbelievable. Forbes magazine. Not is there such a thing or where would you find it, but why are we so addicted to it? It's because the only thing that we're looking at is how can I buy the cheapest car? How can I buy the cheapest candy bar? What about the quality that went into that and whether or not it created an enhanced life for those who produced it rather than limited their options? You see, when I went around the world, I discovered that many of the products I buy every day are somehow linked to a global forced labor slave trade. The shoes I was wearing, the shirts I had on, the coffee I drank, the sugar I poured in my coffee... Well, you know, you and I don't want to wear people's suffering. We don't want to tread on people's dreams with our shoes, do we? We don't want to consume people's suffering, but how would I know? 
Like, how would you know that Firestone Tires has 21 lawsuits against it for the way they produce tires in Liberia out of the rubber plantation? Now that I've told you, why would you buy a Firestone Tire? Wouldn't you buy a Pirelli Tire that makes sure that everyone is free to work? But how would you know that information? You see, if I want to change the world then, I have to create tools that give you information that's useful, but when you need it. So, with my team, we created a metric system of 40 different factors that go into every product you might wear or buy. And it tells you whether that product deserves an A, because it enhances the lives of those who made it, or an F, because it took away their future. So, if you're wearing Levi jeans tonight, Congratulations, you're enhancing people's lives because it gets a B. On the other hand, if you have Hanes underwear on, it's a D minus, so I want you to take it off right now. <laughs> so that's really useful stuff. Now we have a way of measuring. You can go to freetowork.org, a website that's accessible anywhere in the world, and we're increasingly grading products of all types. Now the great thing about this, this is not a gotcha kind of thing, is that we send the report to a company before we publish their grade. You see, we don't want to make them look bad. We want them to look good. Help us know if you are producing a product in ways that we don't know about. Here's your scorecard. And they get back to us, and we improve their grade. Two out of three companies that we grade come back to us and say, how can we improve our score? You see, that's how you bring about real change. And then we try to encourage, then, those companies to change their behavior. So you have a major company like Manpower. Manpower, Inc., the largest temporary labor employer in the world, has now said that wherever we operate in the world, we're committed to free to work. So that they now ensure that in every office, they go down to the very last paycheck, that the people who are working for them are actually the ones that signed up and actually are getting paid. We need more of the Fortune 500 companies globally to get involved. Now we also, it really has power when consumers start buying differently. We don't talk about boycotts, we talk about boycotts. Right? When you start shifting your demand and start shifting your behavior, then you really start to make a difference. So when you learn from Forbes magazine that 70% of the chocolate bars you buy are tied to the global slave trade, mostly in West Africa, Ivory Coast, Ghana, why would you buy that kind of Kit Kat bar or that Cadbury's bar when you can buy great chocolate that is made in such a way that it helps families who actually pick the cocoa beans? We have a campaign throughout universities and churches and religious communities of all types as well as community groups, and we sell A-grade chocolate. And for every chocolate bar we sell, we then build a school or build a community project in those areas that have been affected by slavery here in Africa. So it's a way of tying, again, what we buy, how we work, how we live is linked to how others are going to prosper. It really is a remarkable way to talk about the ways that we use innovation. So it's fantastic to be in front of a group of people tonight who see that their future lives are going to bring a network of resources and innovative technology tools and new economic models. And I'd encourage you to look at that in a way that's expansive, not only in terms of a small world in which we typically operate and where we live and move, but into a global world that we pass on to future generations this promise that all of us are given a future destiny. All of us are given the opportunity to live a life where we are the author. And we just want to share that opportunity for others. Because I'm not for sale, and I know you're not for sale. And let's live in a world where no one shall be for sale. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you.